Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us online. Uh, we're pretty excited that you and your family joining me and my family as we dive into an, our online gathering today. If you're tuning in on Facebook Live, you could like, comment, share, or even host a watch party right now. <laughs> that would help us out a lot. And Lucy would be pretty excited about that. If you're on YouTube, you can like the video, subscribe to our YouTube channel to keep up with that all throughout the week. Uh, so this morning, we're going to be a lot more interactive, and we would love to have you interact with us. So we're going to talk, start off just thinking about what we're thankful for. Lucy, what are you thankful for today? For my toys. All right, she's thankful for her toys, which she's now run off to play with. And we would love to have you take a minute and think through what you're thankful for today. Before we spend time worshiping together, we want to pause and praise God. Think of who he is, what he's done, look back on this past week and be thankful. So we're going to give you about a minute to spend some time thinking about what you're thankful for, praying and thanking God for that. We'd also love to have you drop a comment so that we can celebrate with you in the things that you're thankful for entering into this morning. Let's spend some time thanking God right now. Bye. 
Oh, I'm so thankful to be able to worship together with you today as we celebrate Jesus. I love what's happening on the weekend, but I'm even more thankful for what's happening during the week because all throughout the week, we are able to connect in community. See, I often tell people that you haven't really experienced Restored if you haven't engaged in community. We believe that church is not an event you attend, it's a community that you engage in. And although our community groups can't physically meet in person under a stay-at-home order, what we can do is we can meet online. So we have 11 online community groups meeting all throughout the week, and we would love to help you get connected with one of those. Uh, maybe you've never connected with a community group, or honestly, maybe you've drifted away and really need to get reconnected in community in this season. Wherever you're at, we'd love to help you. Uh, if you go to restoredchurch.org backslash join, it's a quick form where you can let us know your availability. We'd love to follow up and get you connected with one of those groups. Uh, maybe you're new and uh, you're trying to uh, figure out how to get connected around here. Uh, it's really easy. You can text the word live right now to 570-354-0846. Uh, text the word live right now and uh, you can get connected with what's happening here. Uh, for any of you that want to get connected or stay connected, you can do that uh, with our online-only website. It's restoredchurch.org backslash online. Highlights everything that's happening in this online-only season. Uh, there's actually a brand new update on there, uh, which you'll find very, very important in this time. So it's a six-minute video uh, that really gives our COVID-19 response plan as a church. Essentially, it answers the question, uh, how long do we plan on this lasting and when do we hope to get back together in person on Sunday mornings? If you're asking those questions, trying to figure out what's next, uh, you can go to that website, restoredchurch.org backslash online, look for the COVID-19 response plan video on there, and you can get all the answers to your questions. Uh, also, one of the things you'll find on that site is that we have some great resources for family ministries in this season. Uh, so while we don't have restored kids and restored youth in person, uh, for restored kids, we have an online Facebook group connected to our Facebook page. Uh, you can go there and get all of the resources to be able to uh, help equip your par or your uh, children with great Bible stories and lessons during this time. Some great resources available to you as parents. Uh, for restored youth, we have a Facebook page that you could like or also an Instagram a page that you could follow. Lots of great things happening for our teens as well as they're meeting together on Friday nights. Well, we are so thankful in this time, uh, especially for our frontline workers in the medical community. Uh, one of those is our very own uh, counseling pastor. Pastor Jim Lane uh, is able to serve as a hospital chaplain with Geisinger. I was able to sit down with Pastor Jim earlier this week and record a Zoom interview so you could hear about what's going on in the front lines, how God is using him in this time. Uh, so let's go ahead and check that out right now. All right. Well, I am so glad to be here uh, with Pastor Jim Lane, uh, my friend, longtime teammate. Uh, Pastor Jim has been with us since day one here at Restored. And uh, Jim, one of the things I've always appreciated about you as a teammate is just your heart for people, your love for the community, and the ways that you've engaged in that in many different ways. Uh, over the last 10 months, God's given you an opportunity uh, working as a chaplain uh, with Geisinger Health System. And I would imagine that when you started, you would have had no idea that God was leading you into chaplaincy in the middle of a pandemic. Right. Uh, but God's given you a, a lot of opportunities uh, throughout this time and just wanted to spend some time uh, talking a little bit about that. Uh, so I'd, I'd love to hear, uh, what is it that you love about being a chaplain in the hospital? Yeah, I appreciate that, the opportunity. Um, you, it's hard to believe it's been that long ago. August, I started with the residency and uh, uh, chaplain work at uh, the hospital is very tiring and challenging. Um, and uh, we are engaged in every population of people. Um, so on an average day for me as a chaplain, when I go in, as long as I'm not carrying that pager, uh, I go and visit rooms. Today I, I spent, I saw 10 patients today, went into the rooms and 
right now things are pretty tough because of the COVID restrictions that are going on in the hospital. And so we may be the only person besides their nurse and their nurse is tending to them. Doctors are tending to them, but a chaplain actually provides emotional and spiritual support. And that really is dependent on what the patient wants to talk about. We don't go in with an agenda. We go in to see what's going on and, I happen to believe that God is present in the room, that I don't have to bring him there, and that if there's anything specifically spiritual or whatever they would like, uh, God will direct that conversation. And uh, the one thing I really love about this is, is um, we also get a chance to interact with staff and provide both emotional and spiritual support for the entire Geisinger medical team. Geisinger. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, we've, we've heard lots of stories uh, on the news about the difficulties in the medical community. We've heard some good stories as well, stories of recovery. Uh, your team as well made it on WNEP a few weeks ago. That was really yeah. cool. Um, but it's really hard, you know, kind of knowing from a distance how things are going. Can, can you just tell us a little bit about how things have been challenging in this COVID-19 season? Yeah, as you mentioned before, uh, the last time we had a pandemic in America was in 1918. So there hasn't been a generation that's alive today that has experienced this type of uh, uh, epidemic that's coming through, pandemic, or that's coming through. One of the biggest challenges that we're facing is the fact that um, this, this virus is so very um, unpredictable in a lot of ways. Um, and uh, a lot of anxiety and tension amongst the staff because, you know, while everybody's staying home and protecting themselves uh, every morning when I or any of the staff walk into that building. We are like firefighters going into an area where people are being treated for the COVID. Um, and so the tension and anxiety was very high. Um, I really appreciate something uh, the, the hospital system itself uh, recognize that we're, we're frontline uh, support. And so immediately they put us into uh, every day, we went to the various COVID areas and uh, we talked with staff. How are you doing? What's going on in your home? How are you feeling? What's, and, and provided whatever support was necessary. So um, yeah, it, it, it's definitely um, a different time to be working in the hospital. But one of the things that's coming of it is we are actually becoming more embedded. Uh, as spiritual care and as chaplains, because now we're not only meeting patients, but we're also being more proactive with staff, which I really want to tell you, they really, really appreciate uh, the fact that there are those who are sitting in the, in the trenches with them, listening to their struggles and, and their difficulties. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. And one of the things that we've been able to do is provide some uh, pretty interesting things. They, they give us an iPad. And uh, we're able to go into the patient's rooms who can't have anybody, and we're calling their family. And mm -hmm. uh, we're actually bringing their, their wife, their husband, their sister, their mother, whatever, to the bedside and uh, allowing them to talk to each other so they can see each other. Um, that's a very powerful moment uh, when you're able to provide that type of support. And our patients have been so grateful. Because they are that's, isolated, and they're, they feel alone. So, yeah, that's, mm. that's some of the challenges we've been experiencing for sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, that's awesome to hear. I think hear, hearing some good news uh, coming out of it is incredibly inspiring and encouraging. Um, you know, I, I know that we are so grateful for everyone in the medical community, for our doctors, our nurses, our assistants, our chaplains, um, and all of those. Uh, some of them are in our church, others of them are uh, elsewhere. And uh, we know this is an incredibly heavy time uh, for all of you in the medical community right now. So uh, I'd love to know, uh, how can we pray for you and our medical community uh, during this crisis? Right, right. Yeah, one of the things you can pray for is um, the, the strain that's going on in their personal lives, because they they are fearful. Um, they're afraid that if they get the, the, the infection, that they may bring it home to their family. That's a real, real concern that they have. Um, and so we, we really appreciate your prayer that, um, you know, the precautions will be taken. Uh, one of the things I really want to challenge our brothers and sisters and those who may hear this video, uh, the weather's going to start getting warmer. And the, the desire to get out of your house, I, I get it. <laughs> 
um, social distancing and masks and all that. Uh, I think that's the new norm. And I'm afraid that if we don't, you know, be proactive, um, there, we could have a, a real bad break and, and more people get sick and it just creates more strain. So I, I guess the thing that I'm saying is, is, you know what, we, we just have to be very cautious, very careful and, um, you know, don't be reckless <laughs> or, um, don't because this virus even though the curve has been leveled what they're saying uh this virus isn't gone it's not so we just gotta be careful because um uh those who are on the front lines will be affected greatly if we are reckless in in our um contact with others and and not not being careful so again just be cautious be careful uh i understand that we need to get out we need to do what we want to be doing but um i think one of the biggest struggles that the medical community is going to have is is if people don't practice uh, you know whatever it would be that to try to keep this from um exploding so mm -hmm. that that's super helpful perspective and i appreciate yeah, that a lot really uh jim i'm i'm so grateful uh for your friendship for your teamwork i'm thankful for for you and everyone that is sacrificially loving people so well in the season by caring for both their physical uh, and their spiritual needs. Uh, we are praying for you. We're cheering you on and we're so grateful for you. I love the chance to be able to hear and to highlight all the ways that God is working in and through Pastor Jim in our medical community in this time. Well, I told you today was going to be a little more interactive. Here's a couple things that uh, I'd like to do right now. Uh, one, I would love it if you could comment to show some appreciation uh, for our entire medical community. Just to say thank you to them, to let them know how much we love them, we care about them, we're praying for them. Uh, maybe you have a family, a friend uh, that's in the medical community. Tag them in a comment right now and just let them know uh, that you're thinking of them, you're praying for them, and you appreciate their sacrificial hard work on the front lines. Second thing we want to do is to take a minute to pause and to pray right now for our medical community. Uh, this is a marathon, not a sprint for them. This is a, they're in it for the long haul. So we want to take a minute right now to pause uh, right there where you're at watching from. Uh, we're going to take the next minute and pray right now for our medical community and even some of the things that Pastor Jim was mentioning in his great story. Uh, after that, we're going to hear a message from Pastor Ryan. Uh, so let's pause right now before our sermon and pray for those in our medical community. Thanks so much for joining us for another week of Church Online. My name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here, and I'm really excited to be continuing our series that we've called Words to Live By, where we're taking bite-sized verses and we're asking you to, to memorize them and to talk about them with your online community groups. And we really believe that these passages that we've chosen, if you'll internalize them, if you'll memorize them and internalize them, that they are words that you will come back to 
uh, again and again and again in your lifetime and your relationship with God. So I'm really excited to continue this series. Let me pray and then we will jump into our verse this morning. Father, we are so thankful that you have given us your word. We're so thankful that you communicate clearly what it looks like to, to, to have a right relationship with you. We're so thankful that you give us examples of real people who really struggled, who really wrestled with their relationship with you, who really wrestled with obedience in their relationship with you. And we're, we're so thankful that you chose to use real people, not only to, to, to communicate to, but also to communicate through real people that wrote the scriptures, that had real life experiences. And that's what we're going to see this morning um, in our verse. We're going to see a man who had a real relationship with you, who had a real struggle and, and a back and forth with you. And you chose to not only communicate gracefully to him, but you also chose to, to communicate through him to us. So this morning, I pray that you would take this message, that you would speak directly to us, that you would use your word to encourage and to challenge and to exhort us this morning for your glory. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, I know how uh, easy it can be to get distracted watching church, maybe in your living room or in some other place in your house. And so I'd love to ask you to, to grab a Bible. Um, maybe if you, if you grab your Bible and you follow along with me verse by verse, that'll help you engage in our passage this morning. If you have a Bible, you can open up your books, uh, your Bibles to the book of Habakkuk. Um, Habakkuk is an Old Testament prophet, a few books back from the New Testament. So if you turn to Matthew, take a left, go back a few books, you should find the book of Habakkuk. That's where we're going to be this morning. So let me, uh, let me hop into our word to live by, our memory verse, and then it's gonna, we're going to kind of have to work backwards from there to get to the lesson that we're going to learn from our word to live by this morning. So Habakkuk chapter 3 starting in verse 17, says this, Even though the fig trees have no blossom, and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails, and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, Habakkuk says, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as a deer, able to tread upon the heights. So what we find here in our words to live by uh, at the end of Habakkuk, as Habakkuk gets to a point where he can say to God, even if everything fails, even if we have no food, there's no crops, there's no fruit on the vine, even if the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. He gets to a point where he can say, even though everything fails, even though I can't see what you're doing, even though I don't understand your plan in this situation, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. And I don't know about you, but sometimes in my Bible reading, I get to powerful truths like this and interactions between people and God. And I say, wow, that's, that's easy for him to say. He's a prophet. He, he got to interact with God on a regular basis. And I, and I tend to over glamorize the, the characters in scripture. And I, I tend to really not realize that these are real people with real struggles who are in a real process in their relationship with God. And what we're going to find in the book of Habakkuk is that it actually took a process for Habakkuk to get to the point where he could say, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. And so I've entitled our message this morning, The Yet Process. The Yet Process. And I think what we all can learn from the story of Habakkuk is the process that it takes for us to get to the point where even in the midst of of everything going wrong, even when it seems like God is absent from our lives and our situations, even when we're crying out to God, what we think are, are perfectly legitimate prayers and he seems absent and he seems distant. I, I think we can get to a point if we, if we really engage in this process with God and this relationship with God, we get to a point where, where we can say, just like Habakkuk, yet I will rejoice 
in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. So uh, let's kind of do a quick survey and, and look at the process that it took Habakkuk to get to the point where he can say, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. So Habakkuk grew up in a time uh, in, in the people of God where there was actually a really good king and, and, and the people of God were really following God. They were being obedient to God. Things were going well in the, in the, um, with the nation of Israel at this time. And ultimately, uh, this is when Habakkuk was a child. And then the good king goes away and we get a couple of more bad kings. And things start to really go downhill. And there's a moral failure and, and God's people are really being disobedient to God. There's violence and, and war and sin everywhere. And so Habakkuk gets to a point where he grew up really knowing what it was like to be obedient to God and to see God's um, favor on his people. And now he's in a situation where it seems like God's totally abandoned his people and his people have totally abandoned him. And Habakkuk just doesn't understand. And he's crying out to God and praying and asking that God would intervene and that God would show up in this situation. And what we have in the book of Habakkuk, it's a short book, three chapters. We have Habakkuk really crying out to God with two complaints, just asking God, why? What are you doing in this situation? And then we have God responding back with two responses. And then ultimately chapter three is this Habakkuk's poetic response to this process that he's had with God, this process where he can get to a point where he can say, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. So what I'd like to do is just do a quick survey of those two complaints and those two responses and see some lessons that we can learn uh, as we try and engage God with our own yet process, with our own process where, where we can get to a point where no matter what happens in our life, no matter what difficulties we might face, that we can get to a point where we can say, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. So like I said, um, Habakkuk now finds himself in a situation where his nation has totally rebelled against God and there's violence and, and corruption and immorality everywhere. And his first complaint we find in chapter one, Starting in verse two, he says, how long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Verse four, he says, the law or your law has become paralyzed. He says the wicked far outnumber the righteous so that justice has become perverted. Habakkuk is a man of God who wants to see God's word obeyed, who wants to see God's people follow God's word. And he looks around at his nation and he sees rebellion. He sees the, the immoral outnumbering the moral. He sees the unrighteous outnumbering the righteous. And he says, God, how long are you going to let this happen? He's, he's praying. He's seeking God. He thinks he's praying a really legitimate prayer. God, how long are you going to sit idly by and let your people continue to disobey you and get away with it? This is a pretty legitimate prayer, right? He's asking God, why are you letting this happen? And God comes in with a response. Chapter one, verse five. This is how God responds to Habakkuk. He says, the Lord replied, look around at the nations. Look and be amazed. For I am doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe even if someone told you about it. All right, pause for a second. If you're Habakkuk, and you just poured out your heart to God and you just prayed and asked God to, to show up and to intervene. And, and he starts out his response with, I am doing something in your own day, something that you wouldn't believe even if I told you about. You're probably starting to get really excited. Like, all right, God, my God is going to show up and he is going to, he is going to do something awesome. But he goes on and he says, I am raising up the Babylonians a cruel and violent people. They will march across the world and conquer the other lands. Wow, that's probably not what Habakkuk had expected. Ultimately, what God says to Habakkuk is, he says, don't worry, I'm going to judge uh, my people. I'm actually going to raise up the Babylonians to bring judgment upon my people, Israel. And, and what we need to understand about the Babylonians is they were a vicious and cruel nation. If we were just to, on paper, compare 
Habakkuk's nation versus the nation of Babylon, we would say, if we had to pick one or the other, Babylon's way worse. In our context, this would be like, this would be similar to like North Korea conquering America, right? Like we would be like, hey, God, like we understand like Americans, we're, we're, we're struggling, we're failing morally, we're a corrupt nation, we're disobeying your word, but the North Koreans, seriously, you're going to use them to conquer us? And that's where Habakkuk really finds himself. And so naturally he moves on to his second complaint. In verse 13, he says, God, but you're pure and you cannot stand the sight of evil. Will you wink at their treachery? Should you be silent while the wicked swallow up people more righteous than they? Notice how he, he plays the comparison game. He says, yeah, we're evil, but we're more righteous than them. Are you going to let them seriously conquer us? Are you going to wink at their treachery, just ignore their violence? Ultimately, Habakkuk says, you can't really use an evil nation to bring judgment upon a less evil nation, can you? Um, and so he finds himself in this wrestling with God. God, you can't use the Babylonians. That, that can't be righteous. That can't be good. You're a good and righteous God. You can't do that, can you? And I don't know about you, but I'm sure that we've all had situations and times in our life where we kind of see what God's doing, whether it be in our nation or in our community or in our family or in our own personal life. And we look around and we say, God, what are you, this doesn't make sense. How are, how are you using these situations? How, how are these pieces all going to work together for my good and for your glory? I don't understand. And God really responds to Habakkuk with a two-part response um, that I think really helps us to learn and to understand the character and nature of God. And if we'll wrestle with some of these truths, hopefully it's going to get us to a point where we can understand that even when we don't understand, even when we don't see God's plan or what God's doing, that we can still get to a point where we say, even though I don't understand what you're doing, even though everything seems to be going wrong, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. So the first part of God's response to Habakkuk, we find in chapter two, verse four, this verse is quoted a few times in the New Testament. Um, and really foundational to our understanding of the gospel. God says, Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous live by faith. The righteous will live by faith. And so what God's telling Habakkuk is, we're not comparing one evil to another evil. He's saying evil is evil, and I'm going to judge all evil. The only people that are righteous are people who live by faith. This is the gospel, that, that salvation doesn't come to people because they're better than other people. We don't, we don't come to God at the end of our lives and say, with a list of other people that we were better than, or a list of the good things that we did in comparison to the bad things, God says, no, all evil is evil, and all evil is going to be judged. The only people who are righteous, the only people who will receive my grace and mercy instead of my judgment are the people who live by faith. He says, rebellion against God is rebellion against God. I'm going to judge this nation because they're in rebellion to me. And yes, I might use this nation right now, but Babylon's going to be judged as well. All evil will eventually be judged. And God's working on an eternal timeline. See, Habakkuk was just working on his few years on earth, and he's looking at what God's doing, and he's saying, this can't be good. This can't be a good plan. But God has an eternal perspective, and he's working on a much uh, different timeline than we are. And sometimes God's good and perfect plans take generations. We, we think about the nation of Israel was in captivity in Egypt for 400 years. Generations of people had to be looking at God and saying, where are your people? Why are we in slavery? But God had a good plan, a perfect and eternal plan. And so he says, all evil is going to be judged. The righteous, the only righteous people are those who live by faith. So yes, I'm going to judge the nation of Israel. Yes, I'm going to judge Babylon. I'm going to judge all evil. The only people that are righteous are those who live by faith. He goes on in verse 14, his second part of his response I love this. This is one of the best verses in all of scripture, I think. He says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water covers the sea. I don't know if you've been to the beach recently, but look out at the ocean and what do you see? Water, 
water covers the ocean. He says, at some point in time, I'm going to make it so that my glory, the knowledge of my glory fills the entire earth like the water covers the sea. One day, Jesus is going to return and he is going to reveal God's perfect and eternal plan in every single nation under heaven and on earth is going to look at God's plan and they're going to see the glory of the Lord as the water covers the sea. God says, my plans are going to be fulfilled, but they are on an eternal timeline. They're not on your temporary timeline. So Habakkuk is in this wrestle, in this process with God where he's He's seeking out answers. He's, he's praying to God and he's asking, God, I don't understand what you're doing. I don't know about you. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you haven't understood God's plan. Maybe you've felt guilty for, for, for coming to God with these type of prayers. But I love that God is, is allowing Habakkuk into this process. And so if you, if you have your own struggles and your own wrestles with God, the, the part of the yet process is bringing them to God in prayer, being willing to be open and honest with God. I think for those of us that grew up in the church, maybe those of us that would call ourselves religious, we might look at some of these prayers and say, I would never question God like that. But we need to be honest and transparent with God about where we're at. So here's our, the, that's Habakkuk's two complaints and God's two responses. And then I love that chapter three really is just a poetic prayer. And I think what we learn from this is, is Habakkuk took some time. This wasn't just an immediate reactionary response. Habakkuk took some time to really dwell on his conversation with God. And he sat down and he wrote a really well thought out, really poetic prayer in response to God. The structure and the history of this prayer demonstrates that it's a process to get to yet, that, that, that Habakkuk didn't just get there overnight, that he didn't immediately just say, okay, I understand, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. No, this is a process. Habakkuk sat down, and, and, and ultimately what we'll find in chapter three is really the first 16 verses is Habakkuk rehearsing the history of the nation of Israel, rehearsing the history of God's people. And so Habakkuk, after wrestling with God in prayer, sits down with God's word and sits down with what he knows to be true about God in the past. And he just has this process where he's trying to get to a point where he can say, you know what? I don't understand why God's doing what he's doing in my lifetime, in my situation. But what I do know is that God has been faithful in the past. And that he's made a promise for the future that he is going to fill the earth with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord like the water covers the sea. And so verses 3 through 16, uh, we don't have time to get into them, but really he's just rehearsing the nation of Israel. He, he, he picks out a couple of different highlights. He highlights Egypt, um, Moses bringing the people of God out of Egypt. He highlights God's presence with his people in the wilderness. He highlights the parting of the Red Sea and the Jordan River and, and, and the story where God calls the sun to stand still for 24 hours so that Joshua and the nation of Israel could continue to conquer the promised land. And so ultimately he, he takes time to recall God's faithfulness in the past. He says, just be, I, even though I can't see it right now, even though I can't see what you're doing in the present, I know that you've been faithful in the past. And I know of your promise in the future. I know that you're going to fill the earth with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord like the water covers the sea. And so as he looks back at God's promises in the past, or at God's faithfulness in the past, and he looks forward to God's promise in the future, this process that he goes through, he gets to a point where he can say in verse 17 through 19, even though the fig tree has no blossoms, and there are no grapes on the vine. And even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, and even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me sure-footed as a deer and able to tread upon the heights. So what are, what are a few lessons that we can learn from the yet process that Habakkuk goes through? And hopefully it will inform us as we go through our own process to get to a point where we can say, even if everything doesn't make sense, even if, even if nothing is going right in my life, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. 
I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. I think the first lesson we can learn is this, that our faith to say yet in the present suffering is fueled by God's faithfulness in the past and his promise for the future. Our faith, the ability that we have to say yet, even in present suffering. Guys, look around. A lot of us right now are in very present suffering. And the thing that fuels our faith to be able to say, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. The thing that fuels that is God's faithfulness in the past. We look back at God's faithfulness in the past from generation to generation. God has been faithful to deliver his people. And we look at the promise to the future, Habakkuk 2.14, where God says, ultimately, I am going to fill the earth with the knowledge of my glory as the water covers the sea. We know that one day Jesus is going to come back and, and he's going to make all things right. And God's plan is going to be so perfect and so good that it's going to fill the earth with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. So the faith that we need to say yet is fueled by God's faithfulness in the past and God's promise for the future. I think the second lesson that we can learn in this process to get to yet is that God has an eternal purpose for our present circumstances. See, we look at just our generation, just our nation, just our community, just our family. We look at this very small sliver of time and we look around and sometimes we can't understand what God's doing. We don't see what he's doing. We don't understand his good plan. Just like Habakkuk looked around and he said, Babylon, you're going to use Babylon to, to, to bring about judgment. They're far worse than we are. But what we find in, in other books of prophecy, the book of Daniel specifically, is that Babylon paved the way for the Medo-Persians, which paved the way for the Greeks, which paved the way for Rome. And Rome brought about peace in the land. And it brought about a road system in a common language, which was the, the perfect pavement for Jesus to come and bring the message of salvation to the entire world. And so what we don't know, what Habakkuk didn't know when he looked at his situation and said, you're going to use Babylon. Habakkuk didn't know that Babylon was actually going to pave the way for Jesus to come. And to, to have his eternal purpose bring salvation, the message of salvation to the entire world. And so when we find ourselves in situations of suffering where we don't understand what God's doing, we've got to cling to the, the truth that we know that he has an eternal purpose. And one of the questions that I like to ask myself when I'm really suffering and struggling to get to yet, struggling to get to the point where I can say, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I like to ask myself, how will I feel about this situation 1,000 years from now? 1,000 years from now, how will I feel about the coronavirus? 1,000 years from now, how will I feel about me being stuck at home for a couple of months? 1,000 years from now, how will I feel about me losing this job? 1,000 years from now, how will I feel about this? And for those of us who have placed our faith and trust in Jesus, we know that, that the glory of the Lord is going to fill the earth as the water covers the sea. A thousand years from now, these, these present sufferings are nothing to compare to the glory that God is going to reveal. And so what we need to ask ourselves is what decision can I make in the midst of this suffering that will benefit me most for eternity? God has an eternal purpose for our present circumstances. And then the last lesson that I think we can learn is that, and this is a challenging one, this book is a, a challenging book. If Jesus is the only yes we ever get to any of our prayers, it's more than enough. If Jesus is the only yes that we get, if everything else fails, if all other circumstances go bad for us, if nothing that we want to happen happens, if Jesus is the only yes, yes you ever get. It's more than enough. Psalm 103 verse 10 says, he does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquity. See, we deserve judgment and wrath, but God has sent Jesus to give us grace and forgiveness. And if Jesus is the only yes we ever get, it's enough. And so this is the process that Habakkuk went to, to get to the point where he could say this, this words to live by passage, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. So I just want to challenge us. I think there's a couple of um, 
faithless responses that we can have as we're struggling with God, as we're having this wrestling in the midst of our suffering. I think there's three ways that we can respond without faith that ultimately lead us into sin and rebellion against God. I think those three faithless responses are this resignation, where we just say, this is just how it is. This is the life that I'm, I'm living and I'm just stuck here. And it leads to self-pity. It leads to us being lazy. It leads to loneliness because people don't want to be around the person that says, well, I'm, this is just my life. I'm just stuck. I'm just trapped. It leads to depression. And so we, we don't interact with God. We don't wrestle with God. We just resign ourselves to this is where I must, this must be my lot in life. So a faithless response is resignation. A faithless response is detachment. Or we just try and ignore our circumstances. And we try and get away from our circumstances. And, and detachment leads to, to alcohol. It leads to porn addiction. It leads to binge watching uh, Netflix. It leads to social media black holes where we're swiping and scrolling. And we're living in a fantasy world because we don't want to deal with the present sufferings that we're in. It leads us to daydream and to fantasize about a different time. So some faithless responses in the yet process, resignation, detachment, and then bravado. We put on this fake face where we're okay and everything's fine. And bravado tends to lead to workaholism. It tends to lead to us putting fake lives on social media, the lives that aren't um, transparent with where we're actually at. We go looking for fight and debate with other people. We sink ourselves into our hobbies. So God's inviting us into when we are in the suffering, when we are in the struggle, he's inviting us into this process to get to yet, into this relationship with him. And some of the, the sinful temptations that we might have are to, to have resignation, detachment, bravado. But, but what we need to do is we need to lean into this process of yet and really seek to trust God. So I'm going to pray and then I'm going to give you some time to um, respond to this message by asking a few questions. What, what, are, what are the faithless responses that you are most tempted to fall into? Is it resignation? Is it bravado? Is it detachment? What are those struggles that you find yourself falling into in this season of quarantine? And then how will you engage in the yet process this week? It's a process. As we wrestle, as we struggle with God, we think about how faithful he's been in the past and his promise for the future is we think that his plan in our situation has an eternal um, plan, that the glory of the Lord is going to fill the earth as the water covers the sea, and that if the only yes we ever get is Jesus, it's more than enough. It's a process to get to the point where we can say, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. Let's pray. Father, I pray for each and every single one of us. I think all of us right now are in a season of difficulty. And God, I pray that we would lean in like Habakkuk leaned in, that we would, that we would lean into this process of yet, that we wouldn't um, just resign ourselves, we wouldn't detach from reality, that we wouldn't put on this fake um, strength, but that we would be vulnerable and transparent and that we would run to you. So God, I pray that you would uh, meet us in this process and, and give us the faith, even when we don't see your plan, even when we don't see your purposes, even when we don't understand what you're doing in our situation, give us the faith to trust your faithfulness in the past, to trust your promise for the future, and to, in the present, say with Habakkuk, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. Amen.
Well, I'm so thankful for that message that Ryan just shared with us this morning from Habakkuk 3. Uh, I know that I needed that. Chances are you did too. And I hope that you'll join us in memorizing that verse uh, this week. Uh, maybe you visualize that somehow, somewhere around your house. Snap a picture of that. Tag our church. We would love to see it uh, as we continue to live out our faith in a really tough season. Maybe you're just uh, tuning in. Uh, if you want to get connected or stay connected, you can go to restoredchurch.org backslash online. Uh, or if you're new, you can text the word live to 570-354-0846. You know, I just want to take a minute and say thank you to so many of you that have worked so hard in this season to uh, be active and creative with meeting the needs of people. Uh, there was one church leader that commented that churches who fail to reach their community in this season will lose the credibility to reach their community after this season. I'm really thankful of that for so many in our church family at Restored. Uh, we have been passionate about and committed to reaching as many people as possible during this time. You know, that, that would not be possible without your generosity. And so many of you that have continued to give as you're able, we want to say thank you. Uh, you are financially investing in the gospel going forward. And while the methods have changed, the mission has not. We are still committed to multiplying followers of Jesus and actually in this season, we're seeing a greater gospel platform and a greater gospel reach as we're able to connect with, uh, minister to, and meet the needs of many people in our city as we're able to mobilize our own people to carry the gospel forward to those that are close to them but far from God. So there's never any pressure to give. But for those of you that would like to do that, uh, you are empowering us to invest uh, diligently and digitally during this time. Uh, if you'd like to give financially, you can do that online by going to restoredchurch.org backslash give, or you can mail any checks made out to Restored Church to 74 South Mead Street uh, in Wilkes-Barre. Uh, so uh, I'm so thankful that we get to spend some time with you this morning. Uh, like I said earlier, I hope if you're not already connected in community, that this will be the week that you're able to step into a community group to stay connected all throughout the week, to be able to experience connection and care as we continue to be the church throughout this season. Uh, we love you guys. We're praying for you and hope you have a great week.